Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer. Um, Buddha at the Gas Pump is an ongoing series of conversations with spiritually awakening people. We've done about 580 of them now. And if this is new to you and you'd like to check out previous ones, please go to batgap.com, B-A-T-G-A-P, and look under the past interviews menu. This program is made possible through the support of uh, appreciative listeners and viewers. So if you appreciate it and would like to help support it, there's a PayPal button on every page of the site, and there's also a page about other ways to donate if you don't like to use PayPal. My guest today is Doug Scott. Hi. Doug is down in Dallas, and uh, I forget when we first got in touch with each other, or you got in touch with me, but um, we started chatting back and forth, and due to COVID, I've been taking a lot of long walks in the woods, and more recently, skis in the woods, skiing, and Doug likes to jog and hike around outside, and so we started making a few messages back and forth to each other, and talking about things, and uh, you know, it soon became apparent that Doug would really be an interesting guy to have on the program. Um, he, he has a website here called Cosmic Christ, which I'm showing on the screen, uh, in which he has written many, many articles that you can read, and we'll be talking about the content of some of those during this conversation. Uh, but Doug said that he wanted to start us off with a little group meditation or something of that nature. So let's do that first. Oh, awesome. Thanks. Well, <clears throat> I think it's always good to open up something like we're doing right now with an invocation to uh, just basically claim out loud what um, is always true, that we're connected and that we're one. But to make that intention is important. So I've got a, a candle here. and I'm going to light it. Um, uh oh! Of course, <laughs> wouldn't it be wouldn't it be it's the case where? <laughs> oh, there we go. Okay, and I'm gonna say, just ask the infinite Creator to be with us here as we explore important things and. I ask that um, whomever is listening will receive what they need to receive, feel validated, and hopefully it'll be somewhat interesting. And we do this all in the union of the Creator's transcendence and incarnation and indwelling presence. Amen. Thank you. And uh, we'll we'll learn more about you as we go along here. But um, I understand, you know, that had a a little bit of a Christian flavor to it, even though it could have been very universal. But I understand you've actually taught a little bit with Richard Rohr, um, who is uh, the Center uh, for Action and Contemplation, and who's, who I think I'm going to be interviewing pretty soon. And, and he, he also works with uh, Cynthia Bourgeau, whom I'm interviewing next week, and uh, Jim Finley, whom I've interviewed. Is that right? Yeah, so you, mm -hmm. you did a little teaching there in some capacity? Yeah, I discovered Richard Rohr back in 1996. Um, I was going through a, a dark time at that point and just serendipity the way it works. Um, listened to one of his uh, CDs and it brought me into a place where I didn't understand, but there was a depth um, that I f completely honored and it was new for me. Um, and so I listened to his stuff over the years and then we actually just connected um, the way the universe works. We met each other and kind of had a, an ongoing email exchange. Um, I see him as one of my primary teachers and mentors. Um, so yeah, a couple of years ago, I was invited to um, do a, a co-lead co a retreat on the Trinity in Albuquerque for um, the Catholic worker movement. And so we got to hang out and Great. do something together. So you had a Catholic upbringing, as I understand it, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. And the reason I giggle is that the, the notes you sent me, it says, Introduction, Catholic upbringing, mystical experiences, UFO. <laughs> so it wasn't a conventional Catholic upbringing. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, the word Catholic means universal. Right. So I'm already dipping my toe into the yeah. universal stuff. <laughs> um, okay. And so um, these mystical experiences, are those something you had when you were young? As early as I can remember, um, the veil f for uh -huh. me was pretty thin, 
and I just intuited presences. I intuited, um, uh, yeah, just spiritual beings. Um, Jesus being one, uh, Mother Mary being another, my guardian angel being another, and uh, certain saints um, that we venerate in the Catholic Church. I could really get a sense of their presence in my life. How, um, try to flesh that out a little bit. Like, what was the nature of that experience? It was, and how did you, are, are you kind of looking back years ago and now putting labels on them as to who they were? Or even then, did you have a feeling, oh, this is Jesus, this is Mother Mary, and so on? Oh, it was more like I knew that I would want to connect mm -hmm. with Jesus. And uh, when I would hear teachings about Jesus, I would just get a, a sense of um, the person um, inside me. You know, it was, it was this um, relationship yeah. from the very beginning kind of thing. Um, but I didn't see visions per se. Um, later as an adult, I learned how to see with my heart eyes, which I call them. Um, it's a way to kind of use imag the imaginal realm or um, uh, being able to see through visions, but it's not necessarily with these eyes, but it's more um, something that's over transposed on reality. So you can kind of get a sense of seeing beings that way. But at that particular time, it was much more of an intuitive uh, presence yeah. that I would feel. Yeah, there's a thing in the Vedic tradition, I think it's from the Yoga Sutras, called the Ritambara Pragya, where you can sort of tune into such a deep level that you can pretty much cognize anything. It's not just a fantasy uh, or hallucination or anything. It's more like a real kind of a manifestation of the thing on a subtle level where you're actually, there's some real substance or reality to it. Absolutely. And in fact, um, your guest next week will really go into that imaginal realm. That's the amazing stuff. Um, but yeah, I, I think that the subtle realm and is hopefully if the conversation moves in that way, um, we will find how the subtle realm is actually larger and the realm that you and I occupy, uh, this third density reality is actually inside yeah. the subtle realm. And so you can learn to tap into those higher realms. I love that stuff. Um, not that I try to tap into them, but just the under. But, you know, even without trying, I think as you grow spiritually, you access those realms more and more. Uh, there's more of a collaborative arrangement going on where they're helping you and you're helping them, perhaps, you think? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I think there's always an exchange. I think it happens constantly. It's just that are we yeah. attuned to it? Uh, and in fact, uh, one of the greatest connections we will have um, throughout our lifetime is what's known as the higher self. And the higher self, according to um, the material, the law of one, which has been inspirational for me uh, for the past, I guess, seven years, is who we are, it's who you are, it's who I am. But it's that being or that person is actually located in uh, the sixth density. And so that would be equivalent to uh, the sixth chakra of the being in whom that we are connected. So, you know, we have the six chakra, we have seven chakras, um, just like you and I have seven chakras, uh, the logos in which we inhabit has seven chakras. And so it's beings within beings within beings um, is kind of how I understand the metaphysics. And so the seven chakras of the logos uh, would be different bandwidths of consciousness. And this higher self exists on the sixth chakra, the sixth density. And you can actually have um, connection and conversation all the time with this. Let me try to understand that better. So. Uh, de define the logos again, if you didn't already. Okay, <laughs> yeah, I sort of jumped into the cosmology. And we're gonna look, we'll look back and um, talk more about you too. In fact, I got an email from somebody this week saying, you know, when you interview somebody, could you please make sure to have them explain themselves a little bit, so we we know exactly who it is we're listening to and who their teachers were and formative influences and stuff like that. So we don't want to leave that out. But since we since we yeah. leapt into this logos thing, let's let's get that and then we'll loop back. <laughs> okay, great. Um, 
The way I understand this material, the law of one, the metaphysics, is that you have an original creator. It's called the infinite creator. And the infinite creator would be um, all that is. And the infinite creator creates. And uh, the first thing it creates is this thing called love. Um, love can take on a sentience, almost like a, a person, capital P. Um, and that would be the logos now as a, uh, a person ready to experience itself. Now you use the word logos again, uh, but you still haven't defined it. So okay. yeah, I'm, I'm going to get there. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, well, okay. I'll just say this logos would be, um, it's in law of one material, it's equivalent to love. And it would also be like the word in John first or John, uh, chapter one, verse one, in the beginning was the Logos, and the Logos was with God, and the Logos okay. was God. Uh, that would be the first part of that, that chapter. So Logos would be um, a being that wants to experience itself and then creates sub-Logoi, which would be like suns and stars, and that creates sub-sub-Logoi, which are mm -hmm. you and I. And so there's, like I said, if you have a holographic universe and then inside that holographic universe, you have holons or, or, or parts of it. And each part is all united with the macro, the, holo the holographic universe. Um, and as above, so below, as below, so above. So if what we find true cos uh, cosmologically in the upper realms, if you will, in the macro sense, we're going to find it in the micro sense too, and vice versa. So um, the logos would be, uh, Ra talks about, and we'll get into who that is, but in the law of one, it talks about the galactic logos. Um, for, for lack of a better word, that would be a, the, the galaxy that we inhabit would be the body of, um, our local lo logos in the grand scheme of things. And then all of the stars would be different sub logoi. Yeah. So maybe one logos. way of explaining it, see if this is, see if this works is that like there's infinite intelligence, like you said, the sort of infinite creator, and then the creator wishing to know himself, um, kind of the symmetries break and there's more and more, um, diversification and this diversification it involves, um, you know, varying hierarchies like Chinese dolls, varying s structure or Russian dolls, various sort of structures uh, of intelligence that are, um, you know, tiny by comparison with the, the, the totality, but, you know, relatively large, like a galaxy here or perhaps a cluster of galaxies there. And um, and then within the galaxies, stars, and then around the stars, planets, and on the planets, beings. And so all of these are different logoi, which is the plural of logos, I take it. And um, each yeah. of them is an embodiment uh, of intelligence. Uh, it's a, a, a mechanism through which intelligence can, be, can function or re be reflected. And, and we can keep going down. I mean, within our body, there are you know, 60 trillion cells or something, and each one of those would be a little yep. logoi, <laughs> logos. I mean, have I got it? Yeah, and actually, oh my gosh, well, you said it better than I did. <laughs> and the other thing, too, is not only do our cells make up our body, so we are the logos for our cells, but we are also um, creators insofar as we create what's called thought forms. Uh, or in some traditions, they call them elementals. But that would be uh, actual, if you will, um, in some way, sentient entities in and of themselves imbued with the uh, power and, you know, the sort of the nature of our thoughts or feelings um, can be themselves somewhat yeah. sentient. And they can be positive or negative. I'll, I'll tell you a quick story. I have a friend who lived in Louisiana, and he was a teacher of transcendental meditation and unbeknownst to him some article came out in a local paper 
Uh, and it was very negative. Oh, this is Hinduism and it's the devil and all this stuff. And he didn't even know the article came out. And he was sitting there in his meditation that morning and all of a sudden he felt like he was all these weird negative things were coming at him and he thought, what in the heck is going on? And then later on he discovered the article. So obviously everybody in Baton Rouge or wherever he was, uh, was reading that paper and f projecting all this negativity on onto him and it was finding him and uh, he was experiencing it. And he was the kind of guy who had like, Absolutely. you know, clear experiences like that. I think that once we become aware of this stuff, we'll start to see that it happens uh -huh. all the time. Um, it's not something to be scared about. It's just yeah. how nature works. And, uh, and good thoughts, positive thoughts work the same way. I mean, blessings sure, work Sure, there's the all same kinds way. of stories of healings and, and things like that where people yeah. direct their attention. So it's almost like we create little yeah. sorcerer's apprentices or something who, who <laughs> you know, scurry about and, uh, you know, carry out our intentions. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I think that would sort of be the nature of what's called magic, mm -hmm. you know, not magic in terms of pulling out the rabbit in the, in the hat, but um, magic in terms of uh, changing consciousness yeah. intentionally. And so what that implies, what we've discussed so far, is that everything is sort of seamlessly interconnected um, and nothing is isolated from any from anything else ultimately and that the part you know influences the whole every little bit influences everything else right yeah yeah and that would be how karma true. works out and stuff you know it, r r waves of influence coming out going out but it's all an intelligent system so it all can kind of come back to its sender eventually yeah, and you bring up a good point. I mean, nothing that we're really going to say today, in my opinion, is going to be very different from what you already know and what most of the listeners already know from their various traditions. Um, and we know on a deeper level, right. you know, intuitively. But my my personal feeling is that there are, and I'm coming from a Christian background, um, I think that Christianity, if it's going to contribute positively uh, moving forward is going to need to start to look at some of this meta reality that's really going on and not see it scary or, or um, evil, but actually see it how it can be incorporated into what Christianity's always said from yeah. the very beginning. Um, and so that's sort of one of the pushes, maybe vocations I could say um, that I have is to marry the the Christian uh, background, uh, even conventional Christianity, with the cosmic in a way that um, affirms yeah. both. And if religions are ever going to get along with each other, then ultimately that's the place where they would have to meet, you know, if, if they could all sort of go deep enough to understand the cosmic or mystical dimensions of their own tradition, they would find that there's a perfect overlapping Venn diagram <laughs> with all the other traditions once you get down there, you know? Oh, yeah. I mean, absolutely. In fact, the, the more rooted you go, the, the deeper you go, um, it really is drawing from the same yeah, scheme. Sure. You know, the, the river below all the rivers, it's all drawing from the same stream. And what I argue a lot of, in my articles is that that stream is called the law of one. Or well, that's at least that's um, one thing we could call it. Or that's what it, that's what the law of one materials call it. Well, I'm not saying it's necessarily the law of one material. Uh, you know, that's its own, you know, material and it has its own distortions. But I'm just saying that unity insofar as that everything is connected, everything is in union with everything else. And there's a way that um, uh, God is experiencing God's self through manifestation. Like that would be a, a perennial truth. And that, yeah. that's the law of one. That's good. Okay, we got off on this tangent because you were starting to talk about the higher self. And you were saying something about how the higher self is the sixth chakra or something of the Logos. And I don't completely understand that yet. Um, so let's, let's finish off that thought before we keep going. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and I apologize for that. That's, well, that's all right. I'm taking us quick. off track too. 
Okay. Um, <clears throat> the the way that the law of one material understands the uh, densities, and the densities would be another name for the chakras of God, and it's not densities insofar as um, how dense material is. Uh, the law of one talks about densities in terms of how dense light, love and light is. So how dense consciousness is. So, so for instance, um, my glasses here are a fairly dense form of consciousness. They have materiality and, you know, they have chemical components and so on and so forth. Whereas a thought is, is a much less dense form. I mean, is that the kind of thing you're, you're, you're saying here? Well, other way around, um, the glasses would be not very dense form of consciousness. It's very dense materially, but there's not a lot of consciousness. No, but aren't there. the glasses consciousness having having kind of crystallized into plastic and metal and so on? Yeah. Yes. Well, okay, in that sense for sure. Um, but it would be more like to what degree do the glasses know that right. they're glasses? Pretty much not. <laughs> yeah. So what do the degree, I mean, really, I think consciousness in the, the way we're talking about and density wise is to what degree do we know that we are one with everything, yeah. including God and the higher. And I don't even know if I like to use the word higher, although I, I think it's easier when we talk in language. I think more expansive would be the word that I'd like to, to use. But um, the more expansive we get in terms of consciousness, the more we understand our um complete union with God yes. as, as God. Actually. Right. And we're capable of becoming more expansive because, you know, we as a mind body system or whatever are a much more sof refined instrument than these glasses, which, you know, don't really stand a chance of knowing their oneness of God with God. <laughs> yeah. So like the first density, for example, would be the uh, elements, um, rock and, minerals Metals and, and everything um, yeah that kind of thing yeah and i mean this is going to be nothing new from what you've what we've all understood in terms of evolution um the second density would be the very beginning it starts like let's say from the you the prokaryotic cells um all the way to evolved apes or dolphins or pets pets are highly advanced second density um creatures as well as some trees and plants that, that start to take on a sentience of their own. And when uh, the law of one states that when the second density starts to begin to um, awaken to a level of their own individuality to some degree, um, and that can be invested by third density beings. So for example, um, if you have a dog or a cat, uh, your relationship with that animal and their relationship with you is is awakening in them a new sense of self. It's activating uh, higher elements inside them that when they die, their body dies, um, there's a good chance that they'll actually move into the third density in the next. Yeah, I was just listening to that this morning. I, I've listened to pretty much the whole of book one of The Law of One. I don't know how many books there are. Um, but I can remember right where I was on the trail in, in the woods skiing when, when, they, when they made that point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and yeah. it's really cool. It's really cool. Um, I mean, you know, I look in my cat's eyes or my dog's eyes, and I just, I just know, I just intuitively know that um, I, it is my privilege to be a part of their own evolution so they can move into third density somewhere else, some yeah. other planet. But just to, just to finish the thought... Um, and so that would be second density. And a third density would be where you and I inhabit. Um, third density is, every, is our world here. And it is the density where creation becomes aware that it's creation. You know, we become self-aware. And then um, fourth density would be the next one. And that's the study of um, universal love and understanding. It's, it's the bandwidth of conscious of universal love and understanding. Which humans are capable From of. There, so you're not necessarily talking about ab above the human level now, right? Um, we, we can absolutely be capable of that. Humans, I mean, there's, gosh, there's so much we can talk about. It's, it's really exciting. But um, yes, 
although the actual density itself will be in a way um, that, and who knows how long it's going to be before the earth shifts into the fourth density, and we are absolutely in the progress of doing that now. Uh, when that happens, there's going to be some way in which human bodies are going to be slightly different in order to handle the kind of love and light that um, that will be a good environment for us to learn love and understanding in a, in a new way okay, than we know now. So, so even though there may be people on the earth now who are very fourth density in their experience, um, you're talking about a predominance of such people, which would then shift the whole planet to fourth density. Is that right? And that's what we're doing right now. That's what's going on yeah. right now. And, uh, and let me, let me put a, let me put, let's put a pin on that one. Let me just finish off the sixth density and come back to that. Cause that's super important, uh, at least from my perspective. Um, so the fifth density is one in which, um, well, let me just say this, the fourth density, the big thing in fourth density is that just like your cells make up you and me, Rick, you know, makes up Rick and my cells make up Doug in the fourth density later on, um, all of our hu other, other humans come together and create a new, what's called social memory complex. And we'll get to that in a minute, but that's a new body. So it's a, it's like everybody is online connected but it's not going to be technologically based. It's going to be a, a, a psychic heart connection. And that's already starting to happen. Um, but then in the fifth density, it's, it's a concentration of what is wisdom. And for me, I think I understand that is how does karma play out in, in everything? Like how, how does actually karma, the, the, the small nuances of karma. And then finally in sixth density, it is called the density of unity. So it's, it's love that was learned in fourth density with wisdom that's learned in fifth density. And it is now a unified thing where all paradoxes are resolved. And from that point, um, you know, incredibly advanced beings um, and they're outside of time. And so everybody, and this is what the law of one says, every single human being, you and me, we have a higher self that exists on the sixth density uh -huh. right now. And that sixth density is, you know, like two billion years more advanced than what you and I are. Um, but it is, since it's outside of time, it's connected with us. It is us. And we can appeal to its wisdom and, and we can call. Okay, so it. it's two billion years more advanced in the sense that it would take us two billion years to actually get to a level of evolution where that's our primary orientation or dwelling place. Um, but nonetheless, we're already connected to it. A, a kind of a portion of us is. Um, so we have like a, yes. a fingertip sticking into the sixth density, but the rest of us, most of us is down <laughs> in the third density with some fourth, maybe mixed in or whatever. That's what you're saying. We're kind of multidimensional uh -huh. and, and it's a question of where the predominance of your existence resides. Okay. Exactly. And we are here on third density for really mm -hmm. good reasons. Um, and so it's not that third density is a lesser density. In fact, the first density is just as important, it's just as sacred, full of the majesty of the one infinite creator as the highest yeah. density. So there is no condensation of ontological importance. Um, it, the, it, the very, all of the densities are God experiencing God's self through that particular level right. of consciousness. Just sort of vibrating at different frequencies or something like that. Yeah, you could say sure. that. Yeah, that makes sense because... Um, if God is really all pervading and I'm omnipresent and all that stuff, then he pervades the rocks just as much as he pervades Jesus Christ's body or some such thing. And, um, you know, and, and actually, if you look closely at a rock and you see the marvelous intelligence, you know, orchestrating every little atom and molecule and crystal and everything within it, boom, there it is, staring you in the face. <laughs> yep. And not, not only is that exactly true, um, 
but I also believe that the material itself is yes. God. What else could it be? Uh, exactly. And this is something, you know, for us Christians, I, I want to invite us to consider that, um, you know, th there has been a big push against what's, what's called pantheism. Uh, pantheism is that everything is God. And in the um, Christian tradition, uh, that is considered heresy because God needs to be separate from, it's almost like God is considered to have a different substance, made from a different substance than creation. Uh, but that just doesn't work anymore when you start to have non-dual consciousness. Um, well, well, I just so always wondered just, about that, because I, 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 it was my understanding that the Christians say God is omnipresent, and so how could they, if, if they're going to say that, how could they, they say in the next breath that he's somehow separate from something? <laughs> I think that it's a subtle cognitive um, dissonance that is slowly getting resolved, uh, you know, you'll see some of these incredible teachers um, who will talk about how God is everywhere and God is manifesting as everything. And then the very next breath, they'll talk about how uh, we're not talking about pantheism here, you know. And so there's, there's still that guilt or shame they might feel. But the way I understand it is that both pantheism, which is everything is God, and panentheism, which is everything is in God and God is in everything, are both true. It, it's, it's not either or, it is both true, because how else could it be? So God incarnates God's self as physical things, and God indwells in everything too. Yeah. I mean, it's basically the two are the same. It's just that panentheism is a bit more of an elaboration of, of the concept. Yeah. And panentheism has some really good um, connotations because you can start to say that through panentheism, through that understanding, one can enter into a relationship with the presence that is indwelling in everything. And I think for humans in third density, that is super important to Relationality, the idea of being in relationship um, and living from a healthy relationship is super important to activate the heart chakra. And I think that having an ability to have a relationship with the divine, not only can we say that we are divine and that divine transcends us, but that we can have a relationship with the divine is an important thing for us third yeah. density humans. I think maybe the reason pan pantheism got a bad rap is that you know people would go to you know, what do they call those guys um, who, missionaries, would go to cultures like India, and, you know, s various places, and they'd see people apparently worshipping stones or, you know, doing things that, or having many gods and stuff like that. And right. they kind of misunderstand the the deeper significance of it. Yeah, and I think back in those times, and of course you'll still find that today, there was this understanding that um, maybe every tree or every rock was its own God in and of themselves. Well, that's okay, too, <laughs> uh, <and> so, <laughs> you know, because it's a Logos. <laughs> it, and actually, yeah. it's true. It's true. Uh, but it wouldn't be considered the infinite creator God, like uh, the macro God. Um, it's a part of yeah. the macro God. Just like, uh, you know, I mean, some great football player is a part of the team. It's just one particular, is playing a particular role in the totality of God. Well said. Yeah. Especially in Texas, you said football. There so you I go. Think a lot of people understand that. Uh, go Cowboys. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't watched a Cowboy game in 15 years. I'm not a very yeah. good Texan. <laughs> um, I guess another point there, you meant, you were mentioning, uh, um, you know, the, the notion that God is within us and so on. I, I think that the, well, you can explain why, why does that trip up Christians? It, you know, are they they're thinking we're kind of glorifying the ego and, you know, claiming divine, uh, you know, status or something, which we don't deserve? <laughs> no, um, Christians would believe that God is in us. I mean, that is, uh, that notion from a Christian standpoint, from a conventional Christian standpoint would say that, um, it was through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit afterwards that we could learn that Jesus, that um, 
God indwells in us. But that's not how I understand it. And I don't think that's how a lot of mystics, uh, Christian mystics understand it. That's conventional Christianity. And I'm not saying it's necessarily wrong. Um, but what I would understand it as is that it's, that has always been true. It, it's not that uh, the Jesus event created something new that didn't exist before. No, I mean, th throughout the whole universe, so God dwells in all beings. Exactly, yeah, from the very yeah. beginning. Um, but there seems to be this, this notion in Christianity that we have some kind of deep intrinsic evil, you know, that um, original sin and all that. And I'm not sure how that relates to the idea of God being within us. Okay, there, there's a really cool tangent we can move into, and maybe this is, this is where we want to go. Um, if, if, you, if you're wanting to talk about original sin, I, I definitely have some thoughts on how to um, synthesize that with this non-dual aspect. Um, so let me, let me just uh, briefly say it this way. Um, according to, this is all according to the law of one material, but also other esoteric stuff that I've read in the past. So there's, there's some collaboration here. At, originally, let's say 14 billion years ago, now who knows how many universes there are. I mean, Ra talks about how it's an infinite creation, so there's never been not yeah. creation. And, and good but old our Western physicists universe. speculate the same thing. Cosmologists, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, that's and people are starting to talk about the multiverse as being how it is, which is beautiful. But um, let's say at the beginning of this universe, uh, there would be a way in which um, all of the previous lessons, like the infinite creator, all of the previous lessons of all the other uh, universes and experience packages all that together and creates a template, you know, and then imbues that into this new creation, uh, the, the, our universe. And so the universe starts to unfold first density, second density, third density. But what the law of one says, and this is really interesting, is that um, at the beginning of third density, and Ra would situate this at the stars close to the center of the Milky Way galaxy. Um, so when those stars, planets around them started to form third density, there was not what's called the veil of forgetting in place. In other words, the third density humans um, that were that emerged from that through evolution would have always understood that they were completely one with each other, completely one with God, and it would be as if um, the baby was never separated from the umbilical cord. There was never a separation, so therefore, there was never a catalyst or experience that was very intense. There was never a fear that was an intense. There was never a joy that was an intense love, you know, love, anything, because you already were given everything. And uh, the Law of One material talks about how the third density experience then was so slow, it would be the equivalent of a turtle racing a <laughs> cheetah. Um, and so because there weren't any challenges helped. because we were so connected with God, is that it? Yeah. What would be the catalyst to, to have to grow to fourth density? Because the natural, the natural desire of, of the Creator, no matter what level, is to seek and become one, to go through this evolution slowly. And in third density, it would be kind of already yeah. bliss. Uh, there's. There's, there's no catalyst to, to kind of have Yeah, faith. I've heard from a couple of sources that, you know, the angels or those who live in celestial realms don't have a lot of impetus to evolve because, you know, things are nice. There, there wouldn't be, yeah. So what the, the Logoi kind of decided as, a, as one voice, the univocity uh, of the Logoi, uh, kind of decided that, you know, we love the idea, we have always given free will to everything, but we realize like we're awakening because, you know, God is evolving through us. You know, the, God is always in evolution. So God is starting to say, the Logoi are starting to say, uh, what if we were to create a veil between the conscious level and the unconscious level of third density beings? Um, so that, and the unconscious would be connected to all there is, you know, the, 
there would be a way in which through the unconscious, you could understand everything and that would be the umbilical cord. So they created this veil of forgetting that happened. Um, and that would be what Ra talks about the equivalent of going, uh, where you could see a multi vast faceted diamond, completely beautiful, you know, before the veil, you understood everything. Um, and then, it would be the equivalent of lights out, you're in a cave, and what do you do? Uh, maybe the only thing you have is a, is a lighter in front of you, a candle to kind of, a candle to lead you. And some really, really interesting things happen. Um, as you can imagine, with the veil in place, uh, something new happened that wasn't available in third density prior to the veil. And that new thing was what we, you and I call faith. Um, faith would be, and how I define it is, uh, love is hope plus trust, you know? And Ra talks about faith as being the faculty of the heart and throat chakra. So we have love and understanding, wisdom, and the sixth chakra of unity, of being able to connect um, with this idea that I don't know where I'm going, but I'm trusting. And through that trust, we get to uh, slowly pierce the veil. Uh, but all of these catalysts started happening. The catalysts were very, very intense with the veil in place. And then you could um, progress through third density a lot faster. I have three questions yeah. at this point, And let me know if I'm taking you off track, you know, because you might have a few points lined up in your head that I, I, that you intend to express, and I don't want to sidetrack you. But based upon what you just said, I have three questions. Two of them are small, and others. the other one we might want to get into. But the, the, the small ones are, you, you were talking about the center of the galaxy and the, third, the, the beings who lived there, and they, there was no veil, and they were in touch with God. Uh, were you implying that, that towards the center of galaxies, it's a higher realm, a, a more evolved place? That's question number one. Well, when we're talking about linear time, yeah. So it, it kind of started out that way. Uh, they would be have gone through third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, you know, densities because there's an evolution yeah. outward too. So where we are out about three quarters of the way out in the Milky Way galaxy, is this sort of like the the armpit of the galaxy and not not such... <laughs> <laughs> different part of the body <laughs> um no in, interestingly what uh the law of one material says is that our particular area how far we are out from the center we have received uh the logoi have received all of the um instructions on how to create from previous experiences so we are actually the earth and whatever band is around in our area through the galaxy. We are experiencing a really, really advanced way to live through huh. third density. So just to follow up on that. So can we imagine concentric rings and we're in a particular ring at this distance from the center of the galaxy and pretty much everyone in this whole ring is kind of on the same level of development or something? That is not impl that is not oh, okay. said anywhere in the law of one, but that's sort of how I understand yeah. it. So I mean, okay, you know, yeah, knows? and a lot of these questions, you know, it's like who knows, um, but who but knows? It's, and it's really not yeah. all that important. Okay, so then the second thing is you were talking about. You said okay, these humans who live near the center of the galaxy, they didn't have a veil, and I thought humans. Why do they have to be humans? Aren't there a gazillion different races, and you know, most of them non-human, and uh, or is the human form, according to Ra, kind of ubiquitous? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. I should have qualified that. Um, again, the way I understand human is not necessarily the way you and I look. It's just um, beings who are self aware. Uh, so they could so look like anything. Should, they could look like like Obi Wan, no, like uh, you know, C three, not C three PO. Who's the big furry one? Uh, yeah, Chewbacca. Chewbacca. They could look like him, and, and but the same principle applies. Yeah, in fact, the law of one material says that um, if that question was brought up, and I, I think the questioner, Don, said, 
So in our galaxy, if you were to add up all of the percentage that would be able to pass on Earth as Earthlings and nobody would shake their head at like, what is that? You know, who is that? Uh, only something like, I don't know, 5% would yeah. look like humans. Yeah, I would, I would think. Um, the rest. Yeah, I mean. Yeah. But, and, and they say that, you know, the way that we look is not important at all. It's more of just do we have a physical vessel to to house the the kind of uh, consciousness right. work we're okay. doing. So then the bigger question I was getting to, you mentioned that God is evolving through us. And I, I have this sort of on again, off again debate with Tim Freak, who's a British philosopher and friend of mine. And um, he's kind of like shifted from having written a bunch of books about how consciousness is fundamental and everything arises from consciousness to kind of believing that, you know, he had put the cart before the horse and that consciousness and God and everything else somehow evolves as the universe evolves. And, and, and what I, my main point back to him is, well, you know, God can't pull himself up by his own bootstraps. All the intelligence necessary to create the universe must be there at the outset in order for laws of nature to begin to form and everything. But I will grant you that the and so that must be in some kind of unmanifest repository of intelligence. But I will grant you that the manifest value of God evolves, and we're seeing it happen in the form of the universe evolving and all the beings in it. Well, I've listened to a little bit of him talking, and um, his accent's so great that I could just listen to him reading <laughs> phone a, <book. laughs> a phone book, and I'd be happy. He's way smarter than I am, so, you know, but I'll, I'll give you my the way I understand it is... Um, the way I sometimes explain it to people and is if we can imagine infinity as white light, complete and total white light, which would contain all of the different colors. But white light is not there's you can't white light doesn't experience itself because there's no hue. There's there's no it, it's, it contains all potentiality. Of course, it's infinite. There's infinite ob omnipotence, infinite knowing. Uh, but to have some sort of way to understand itself, there had to be a what I call a subtle subject object, all contained within unity, you know, all contained. But there had to be a subtle I thou. Um, and even if the thou understood itself as complete in union with the I, there needed to be some hue to have experience. And so um, so you can imagine, you know, we've got we've got this white light and then the white light at some point says, let's come up with this crazy novel, totally crazy novel idea that, that from the backdrop of infinity is really new. And that idea is limitation. That idea is finity or finitude. And so the way I try to um, imagine it as that idea, let's say becomes a prism and so now the white light shines itself through the prism. And what you have is seven densities. You've got the, the rainbow, you know, and each density is light. It's completely ontologically one with the white light. But now we have differentiation. And in each, in each frequency of the light would contain um, different ways to understand different forms of consciousness, different wavelengths of consciousness. So that red, you know, the big, very first density would understand itself very, very basically, and then it kind of moves up. Um, so yeah, through that, and, oh, and then I should say that all of these hues then get to relate and connect with each other and form new combinations and all of this stuff. So there's an evolution and it's through evolution that God gets to experience what infinity is infinitely. But everything that is manifested was already in potentiation from the very beginning. And I think it's maybe good to throw in there that um, in going through this whole process, God doesn't create anything other than himself. It's more like within the totality of God, um, apparent forms and diverse diversity arise in order for this play, this evolutionary process to take place. But it's really the, the knower, the known, and the process of knowing are all God in different roles. And what you just said, I mean, isn't that part of the perennial tradition that most religions at their mystical levels would understand? I, I guess, I don't know. 
I mean, I, that, yeah, I, yeah. I think so. Maybe so. I mean, I think that at the basic levels, yeah. Okay, good. Um, so I have some notes here that I could start taking us off in different directions, but is there anything at, at the, on the tip of your tongue that you want to say before we do that? Well, I think there was two loose ends that I, I didn't uh, totally tie up. So let me just do that really quickly if I could. We had originally talked about original sin. Um, and when, he, when humans here on earth, you know, with the veil of forgetting in place, and what I mean by veil of forgetting, it is the veil of forgetting that we are all one and we are all in union already with everything, including God. That's the veil. Um, with the veil of forgetting in place, there is this deep restlessness, angst, fear, all of these things that humans subconsciously uh, feel and intuit. And it is this, ex it's almost like we were exiled. There's, there's a feeling of being exiled. Uh, so that's where you get the archetype of the Garden of Eden and being kicked out. Um, and people are wondering, why were we exiled? Um, there's a deep knowing that we should be connected with God, but what did we do? Uh, from my perspective, from the law of one, is that there was nothing done. It was simply uh, a way for God to experience God's self by putting down the, the veil of forgetting. But from our side, from, from this side of the veil, uh, it does feel like an exile. And, and so Christians um, intuited that as original sin, that we must have done something. Um, but really, it is, the veil is actually, a in my opinion, the veil is a blessing, it's a grace, it's a beautiful thing, because it is a way that we can all uh, learn very quickly about um, oneness and God and love uh, through learning how to process our catalysts really well. Okay, good. And was there other, another loose end? Uh, the other loose end was um, moving into the fourth density. Uh, and so I, I think that, you know, part like your own show here and uh, people throughout the world, you will hear spiritual teachers um, talking about this mass awakening, you know, everybody awakening and, and people are talking, I mean, even psychologists that are just conventional are talking about awakening. Everybody's, even QAnon's talking about you know? it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So everybody's talking about this awakening. And <clears throat> from a law of one perspective, uh, this is absolutely happening. And we are being uh, inundated with the fourth density energy, the fourth density love and light that's coming in. Earth, Earth has somehow moved into a metaphysical realm where we are in fourth density proper, um, but we are still third density conscious. And that incongruity of having a collective thought form, uh, uh, you know, collective mindset of being in third density while we're in fourth density, uh, love and light is causing a lot of some of the chaos that we're seeing. And, and the law of one talks about yeah, that specifically. Yeah, kind of like you put the Jiffy Pop in the microwave oven and it's getting blasted, but it hasn't popped yet. But people are starting to pop and they're feeling the pressure to pop. They're feeling the pressure. And a lot of people, um, this has been my personal experience with younger people too, um, but a lot of people are have incarnated, have chosen to incarnate here early, let's say early in, in their shift of third density to fourth density um, to help be midwives. You know, like they're here saying, you know, let's say prior to incarnating, like I'll sign up, I'll be a part of the team to help uh, midwife the collective into yeah. fourth density. Let's dwell on this for a little bit. Um, so. Not shifted, but they're being sort of irradiated with that energy of fourth density, to put it that way. And, um, and mm -hmm. yet there's a tremendous inertia, you know, because you don't just sort of, okay, fourth density, boom, I'm there. Uh, you know, there's a lot of, uh, on an individual 
economic, political, you know, so many different technological, so many different levels, there's yeah. so much transformation that would have to take place in order to fully align with fourth density values, whatever they may be, and you can enumerate them. Um, so um, how do you kind of see this playing out? I mean, and do you see the, the current situation with the pandemic and everything as somehow indicative of this process? <laughs> Okay, <clears throat> let's see. This is all my opinion, um, and I'm just basing it on my own studies and, and thoughts on it. I think that um, it's going to be a process, and it's not going to be something overnight. It's not going to be. I, I I don't believe that there's going to be some sort of one yeah, great wake thing up one morning that happens. And, you know, blah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, um, one of the things that the law of one talks about is a lot of people are being born um, with what's called double bodied uh, material, like their, their their actual bodies are able to uh, handle third density and fourth density at the same time. Kind of like the an double AM body. FM radio or something. Yeah. Yeah, and exactly, yeah. And so eventually, as more and more people are being double bodied, uh, and people who are only third density bodied, you know, as, as we all die out and the double bodied comes and they start having children, eventually there'll be a, a sort of a natural progression into uh, fourth density. Um, but and how that looks in terms of the pandemic and all of that stuff, um, again, my opinion, but I have found the pandemic as bad as it is. I mean, it's, you know, I, I am not I'm I'm very privileged uh, to have it not affect me so much financially, but I know a lot of people it, it has. Um, but I, I see it from a global standpoint as a huge invitation to uh, move into love and light more. Um, to be able to have a pause in our life, to be able to look inside um, to not have a, so much of a busy schedule and to allow um, us to not numb out so much and start listening to our inner lives. So I think in some ways it, it's one of those global catalysts that is an invitation. Yeah, I don't necessarily think it was given to us by God like, you know, hey, hey this is a gift. I think in some way our collective way we are as humans um, may have allowed this to yeah. come about. Well, you know, these things happen every hundred years or whatever. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, we, I don't know if we need to read karmic significance into it, although we may, but they, they do yeah. happen cyclically. Um, yeah. And I, I realize that a lot of this is opinion, and, um, you know, a lot of what we're saying here is just sort of interesting philosophical hypothesis, I would say. Um, we're not... Neither of us, is, uh, especially you as the interviewer, are not um, stating this as some kind of dogma that people have to accept or anything. Um, but it's interesting to play with yeah, these ideas. Because I, I think, as you said earlier, yeah. I think a lot of people intuitively f resonate with a lot of things we're discussing. And I, right. I, I, I myself sometimes wonder, how, how do I know this? Or why, why do I believe this? You know, why does this feel so um, resonant with me, so, so um, appropriate, you know? Uh, there's kind of a knowing on some level. Yeah, and what's really strange about that is as a counselor, because that's my primary job, I'm a clinical social worker. So you had asked me for a little yeah. bit of my background. Um, I, uh, right after graduation from undergrad, um, when I ma majored in psychology and Spanish, I uh, joined a lay missionary program and went to Nicaragua for two years with the Franciscans. And um, I was there and that changed my life uh, in so many different ways. And then I came back and worked at a nonprofit for a while. And then I saw that there was a dual master's degree program at, the, at Boston College in Boston. So I uh, enrolled there and I got um, clinical social work masters and a pastoral ministry masters. And I got that in three years. And so from then on, I've I've been primarily a counselor, uh, but I'm always informed by the spirituality because for me, it's two sides of the same coin. <laughs> um, so <clears throat> where were we going? Well, we're talking about um, 
how, how we know things. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. So as a counselor, uh, what I have found for the past five years specifically, you know, there's a saying that when a student is ready, the teacher appears. I also think it works the other way, too. Um, when the guide is ready, the students appear. Um, not that I feel like I'm a great guide, but I'm an, maybe an older brother to some people uh, metaphysically. And so what I have found in the past five years is that a lot of my clients will somehow be led to me and it becomes really apparent to me within the first, I'm going to even say first few minutes um, of me connecting with them, that there's some sort of soul contract prior to this incarnation that um, is being honored at this particular moment. And that my job is to simply uh, help them blast through the gravity of whatever is holding them back from awakening to the level that they want to. Um, maybe that's somehow connected to uh, psychological issues. Maybe it's a belief system that uh, is not resonant with them anymore, but they don't have the, the, the words or concepts to make sense of how they're actually feeling. So I've gotten at that a lot. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so you got that double masters and so on. You got it. Now in your notes, it says, well, it says something about UFO. Did you have some kind of UFO experience when you were young? What was <laughs> yeah. that? Um, when I was in first grade, uh, it's really strange. I was always, always into sci-fi. But when I was in first grade, I had this really, really strong feeling that um, and I think a lot of people have this, uh, that I wasn't necessarily like out there was home somehow. Um, it was just this really, really strong intuition. And I really couldn't talk to anybody. I grew up in rural Texas, uh, really couldn't talk to anybody about it. Although I, it's still a joke today that my family used to s tell me that I would go around saying, I'm an alien, I'm an alien. <laughs> <laughs> um, but what ended up happening is when I was in first grade, we were out visiting some family in Oklahoma. And uh, I had this, in the evening, I had this really strong nudge that I've come to trust as intuition. And the nudge said, go outside. And so I went outside and I um, immediately was drawn to what I saw in the sky way above me. And it was a kind of blue orb uh about the size of a full moon and I, I couldn't tell how high it was or anything but there was some sort of um connection that i felt a presence that i felt and i i really can't tell you what it was i, I can't tell you who they were except that there was a, a familiarity there okay that's interesting that was the only UFO experience okay, cool. I've ever had, though. And it also said in your notes something about alcohol recovery. Did you become an alcoholic at one point? Yeah, and I have found this to a lot of spiritual people. Um, we, we are so intuitive, but we don't know how to deal with a lot of the uh, um, emotions that are going on collectively and inside us. And so we'll numb out and alcoholism is in my family. And so I began to drink slowly, you know, in grad school, and then it got a little bit more later on. And once I got married, or I guess when we started having kids, I was a stay at home dad. So um, the monotony of changing diapers and, you know, just everything that's there, stay at home parenting is very difficult. Um, it's a great gift, but it's also very hard. And so I would numb out uh, to alcohol. And you know, in alcohol recovery, they call it, you know, do you, did you hit rock bottom or, you know, where, where, where was it that you turned around? Um, so for me, it wasn't rock bottom. It was a high bottom, <laughs> if you will. So I didn't have to lose anything, thankfully. Uh, but I did end up one night um, really, really drunk. And I ended up sleeping in my son's room on the floor, just sort of feeling a lot of shame. And I made a decision there that I didn't want any of my kids to really grow up. I mean, he was still a, you know, 10 months old to grow up with, with that uh, as me. So that was the last time I had a, any, you know, any drink. 
Um, but it's a great gift. Being in recovery is a great gift because it allowed me to see all the other areas uh, that I have chosen to numb out on instead of meeting life, you know, straight on. Did you on. join AA or did you do it on your own? I did for six months and it was very helpful for me to learn how to live soberly. Um, but I'd also had a lot of uh, training. Um, I was just in a place where I could take what I had learned and then reach in all these other different areas of my life. So I, I feel completely uh, supported and I know AA is there if I ever want yeah. to come back, but so I'm grateful for it. Cool. Yeah. I'm just going through some of these notes because we're filling in some personal details about you, but we'll, I'm sure we'll spin off into these philosophical things again in a minute. Um, oh, sure. you, you mentioned mystical experiences in 2013. Yeah, that's where I sort of pinpoint the, the chapter that I've I'm on now, or maybe the book that I'm on now. Um, prior to 2013, I had really explored a lot of uh, conceptually wise, non-dual Christianity, um, mainly through Richard Rohr, Richard Rohr's work and, and all of that. And I was really happy about it, but I felt like there was something I wasn't seeing, that I wanted to know more. Uh, there was this lar deep desire to explore more what spirituality was. And that particular night, I had been, I had seen 10 clients. It was a Sunday. I'd seen 10 counseling clients. And I was doing my um, notes on the computer. And I heard, again, that nudge. And the nudge said, listen to a chant. And I had never listened to anything but a Gregorian chant, which is, you know, monks singing, Catholic monks singing. Um, but that's not what the, the, the nudge invited me to do. It was a Buddhist chant. So I typed in Buddhist chant in YouTube and just clicked on the first um, video that came up. And what came up for me was a video of Om Mani Padme Hum. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but Om Mani Padme Hum. And as the chant unfolded, um, something new I experienced. And it was as if a, a golden dew uh, of energy just sort of descended around me. I, I, I didn't see it with these eyes, but I absolutely saw it with my heart eyes. And it was very real. Um, and as it's descending, I felt invited into a, a more expansive uh, bandwidth of consciousness, if you will. And from that point, I was intrigued by larger metaphysics, like uh, you know, new age stuff, um, Buddhist stuff, Hindu stuff, all this other stuff that I had never been curious before. And uh, so I sought out a spiritual director to kind of help me understand all of this stuff, um, who was very open minded. And, you know, he was intrigued by what I was saying, and he met me well. Um, and then one night, he just simply sent me an email and it said, uh, it gave me a link to where the law of one material is and said, this is something that has been interesting for my wife and I. That's all he said. And when I clicked on that link, when I started to read the law of one, it was powerful experience for me because it was as if I was um, remembering things that I had sort of known in the past. Uh, putting it into words, and instead of actually hearing the words, because I, I listened to it through YouTube, I was almost seeing images in sort of the geometry or the, the energy behind the concepts that the words were giving. So it was, it was a bit of an engrossing experience, and that's launched me into hmm. where I'm at now. What are the um, Daskalos materials? Right at the same time that I... I uh, discovered or was led to the Law of One materials, I was led to Daskalos, who was a Cypriot mystical Christian. Um, he died in 1996, uh, but he was able to remember all of his past lives. Um, he taught ex very, very, uh, for many, many years on this expansive understanding of Christianity. Um, and he's got books out there. They're, they're a little hard to find, but... Um, his metaphysics, though in very different words, for me was 
totally congruent with the law of one. Um, and so I had both of these different metaphysics that were congruent with each other right at a time when I was exploring things like the astral realms and interested in reincarnation and, and all of that stuff. So it was, it was a cool synchronicity. A couple of questions came in. So um, here's one from Dan in London. He says, uh, we were talking about double bodies before. Can someone that is not double bodied that and is third density only, can they still evolve to fourth density or will they find it much harder? Well, everybody's going to fourth density like no matter not. what. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's just the nature of, of evolution. Um, so a lot of people who are third density bodied here, um, when we die, um, if we are able, there, there's some sort of metaphysical uh, measuring stick. I mean, that's a clumsy way of saying it, but um, if we are able to handle the density of love and light uh, that would be compatible with fourth density living, then we would next time we would incarnate would be in a fourth density environment, whether here it's here on Earth or some other place um, that could host fourth density life. But if someone is not able to handle that fourth density light, um, that's perfectly okay, because it's not that God or anybody else is saying, you, you don't pass, you have to <laughs> go over there. It's, it's simply, it's us evaluating ourselves along with our guides and, and so on. And so we would then um, go elsewhere that would have a third density environment to continue our learning the lessons mm. of third density. I can understand how a third density person wouldn't do so well in a fourth density world, but um, it seems like the other way around would work better, that if you're at a higher density, fourth or fifth or whatever, you could function in lower densities um, Kind of like, you know, a 10-story building, let's say, or seven-story building, whatever. Uh, the view from higher, the view on lower floors is contained within the view from higher floors, but not the other way around. Yes and no. Um, because there is this phenomena called wanderers, and that's in the Law of One material. And wanderers are... Uh, fourth, fifth, or sixth density beings who, through service, for a desire to serve third density humanity, um, choose to incarnate as third density uh, humans. But as all third density humans experience, they also go under the veil of forgetting. So they forget everything. There is no... There is no ready access to anything learned in the higher density. So Jesus or say. Buddha or Ramana um, or all of them could have been fourth or fifth density beings, but they had to sort of, because they incarnated on a third density planet, they had to forget and then re rediscover. Have to forget, have to forget, because otherwise it wouldn't be a bridgement yeah. of free will for other people around them. Uh, because they would then, you know, sort of be worshipped as gods and so on and so forth. Plus, it is not in the nature of uh, a positive being to incarnate in third density as a god. Uh, they're doing it in terms of wanting to serve humanity. And then the the big uh, lesson there is, can you blast through the veil enough to start the mission? And it's a risk. It's a gamble because a lot of wanderers um, never fully never fully awaken, yeah, into their, the sense that they're um, from elsewhere. But I, I want to make a, an important point here, because this is really vogue right now in, in the New Age community. Like, I'm a starseed, I'm a wanderer, you know, and um, this can become such a trap, such an ego trap for people who are, are this is my opinion, I've seen this, uh, for people who want to claim that that they are a higher density being incarnated here in third density. Um, the wanderers that I have met, uh, that I, I believe would be, are people who would not really care if they're wanderers or not. All they want to know, all they want to do is serve. And this kind of thing is not all that interesting. Yeah, they, they might be able to be able to say, yeah, I, I feel like I am. 
Uh, but for them, it's not at all a title to hold on to. It's like a bodhisattva wouldn't say, I'm yeah. a bodhisattva. Yeah, get a T-shirt you know? with a big B on it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or W, as the case may be. Yeah, yeah. and what's interesting about Wander is um, and anybody who can penetrate the veil. So even Law of One group that brought in the Law of One, they call themselves the LL, L and L Research. Uh, the way they define wanderers is um, not necessarily people coming from higher densities to incarnate here in third density, but even third density beings who have progressed on their spiritual evolution, um, let's say, more expansive enough to feel like they don't fit in, that they don't, um, that the, the chaos that's going on doesn't make sense that they're not interested anymore. Maybe they were, but they're not interested anymore uh, of, let's say, third density things that are, you know, most, most of us are interested in. And what they feel really, really called to is just this extreme desire to delve into spirituality. Um, and so that's, that's something we can awaken to. So it's not an elite thing we're trying to talk about here. It is one yeah, of service. Yeah. Um. Got it. Uh, a question related to this came in from Wesley from Salem. I don't know. Wesley asks a question every week. I don't know if it's Salem, Massachusetts or Salem, Oregon or Salem, England or whatever. But anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, his question is, Ra states Jesus was late fourth density when on earth and is now in fifth density relative to our time space location. Ra also mentions that some of the wanderers now on earth are fifth or sixth density. So, do these beings now incarnate have greater realization than Jesus? If so, it seems they would have great cities. Also, if Jesus is in fifth density, what explains his presence in so many people's lives? Yeah, okay, <laughs> big one. <laughs> um, this one was hard for me when I first read that in the, in the Law of One material. Um, to start to see Jesus uh, in a different way than conventional Christianity might um, see him. And the Law of One material says um, that Jesus was a fourth density wanderer. Really, he had graduated from fourth density and was moving to fifth density, but sort of was invited to do a particular mission. Um, and he came in as a, as, as a wanderer. And uh, the law of one says that he remembered more than most wanderers did so that he was able to awaken to some very powerful gnosis and gnosis would be lived experiential knowledge uh, early on. And his was in in line with his own mission that he was specifically I, I don't think that for me, I don't think Jesus was uniquely the son of God, but I think he had a unique uh, incarnation for a specific pur purpose on earth that was unique. Now, that, that's my opinion, too. Um, the Law of One says that most of the wanderers, at least when they were channeling in the 80s, uh, most of the wanderers were sixth density. So, you, you know, you could, you could see them as being more advanced uh, metaphysically. But uh, the sixth density wanderers don't remember much. They don't penetrate the veil. Their, their vocation is different. And um, the primary vocation for a wanderer, Ross says, the very primary one is simply to be embodied here. Uh, what you do with that, what, you, what your vocation is, the actual occupation you have is very secondary. The primary thing is simply to be embodied so that there can be almost conduits of the love and light of fourth density that we're moving into to kind of come through the physical embodiment um, and then up and out into our third density. Right. So you could be running a shoe store or something, but just the very fact of your being on earth embodied, you, you're like a, a conduit, like you said. Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing about cities, um, which is really fascinating, this is going to... I'm, I'm, I'm hoping I'm going to speak to a lot of people when I say what I'm about to say, because I really feel strongly about this. But it also might be something other people disagree with, and that's totally fine. Um, for me, the wanderer or anybody, not, not just a wanderer, but anybody who's on the spiritual path, I think the greatest thing we can do is 
not so much focus in on the subtle realms, although if that's your gift, awesome. Or they are traveling in the astral realms, but if that's your gift, that's great. I think that one of the greatest gifts we can do is actually to fully awaken as much as we can to the idea that everything that you see in this mon what we call so-called mundane, normal world that you and I are in is actually the full plenum of the infinite creator right here expressed fully to us right now that there's n in other words and i have done you know experiments and explorations of the higher realms um out of body experiences and things like that but i can tell you from my experience there's nothing quote up there that's not fully present right here and um there's something absolutely gorgeous and beautiful about being in third density where we can um enjoy what looks like mundane as being God in disguise and engaging yeah. in that way. Well, that's great. Very well put. Um, okay. So I uh, made the type larger on your notes that you sent me and, and <laughs> I printed it out double-sided and I haven't even quite gotten past the, I'm about three quarters of the way down the first page and yet we're three quarters of the way through the interview. Um, so, let me read some of these things and, and tell me if you want to go into them in more detail or, or whether you feel we've already covered them or you want to just skim through them so we can get through more points. But there was a section called Five Foundational Pillars. <laughs> yeah, okay. Triune, nature, um, creator, cruciform, shape, reality, all that stuff. Do you want to get into that or is that not? Yeah, I do because I, I think it's super important. Um, I'm pulling up the same thing here. I got it myself. Okay. So for what I would like to say is this is for, for me how to fully live out this third density experience. So whether someone is a wanderer or or not, it doesn't matter. Um, but for me, a fully really somebody who's really open to spirituality and, and awakening um, is someone who is going to start to um, like I said earlier, uh, use their experience here and now as their ministry. And so you have to have something to stand upon first, uh, some sort of uh, what is the nature of uh, reality. And for me, what is important is that the creator is triune. So this would be one of the five foundational pillars. And what I mean by triune, we talked about it earlier, but it's this sense of a transcendent quality of the infinite creator. Uh, that there's always going to be some level. You talked about the Russian right. nesting dolls. There's always going to be some level of the the next level up that y you always are chasing, you know. Um, then there's going to be this incarnational aspect of the infinite creator that the creator manifests and incarnates as things. And then lastly, there is this indwelling presence that the incarnate, that the creator indwells in all things. And... Uh, just as a side note, I have started to, in my own prayer, I've started to use this in a bodily way. So I'll just do it really quickly because it, it makes sense to me and if other people are interested in it. Um, so I take my palm of my hand and I'll put this on the sixth, sixth chakra in between my eyes. And then I'll put the um, fingertips on the seventh chakra, which is the crown. And I'm going to say, in union with the creator's transcendence, and then I bring my hand all the way down to my second chakra, so just right below my belly button. And then I say, in union with the Creator's incarnation. And then I cross my hands, and I put in union with the Creator's indwelling presence. So it's sort of an honoring from a bodily way the, the triune nature of the Creator. Um, and then the next pillar is that the shape of reality, uh, the way the reality actually works is what's called cruciform. And what I mean by cruciform, and it, it could almost be symbolized by the ankh, you know, the Egyptian ankh or ankh. That's like um, the cross with a little circle on it? Yeah, yeah. So the cross, the, the circle itself could be uh, sort of seen as infinity itself. Um, and then the line down could be seen as uh, infinity manifesting. And then the cross part of it 
could be seen as the level of consciousness that it is. So it kind of comes up and up and up and up, right, right to the very level of infinity. But the way that the infinite creator, the way the manifest, the manifesting of the infant, infant creator unfolds throughout time is always going to be in the pattern of dying and rising, uh, death, rebirth, of losing to find. So it's this pattern of surrender and then transformation. Um, and, and that is true from the atomic level. It's true at the galactic level. But it's also true in our interpersonal experience as third density uh, people. That um, we are always in some ways invited to surrender our uh, experience in order to go into the next level. Um, so, for example, uh, if I'm having a problem with alcohol, then I surrender to the fact that I have a problem with alcohol. That surrendering, that losing, that dying to myself uh, allows me then to be reborn, rebirthed into another level of being that would be sober living. And so that's sort of how it plays out. So everything that you see in every aspect of the manifest, manifested universe follows the same pattern of dying and rising, dying and rising. And the emblem, that sort of symbol of that would be the cross or the ink. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Serving the creator by being myself? Yeah, serving the creator by being myself. And then the next two below that, um, liminal space is home base, as well as lastly, becoming holy feelers. I think that, that those are all sort of the same thing. So let me just say it this way. And this is an invitation to all of us here, all of us listeners um, participating in this, um, to be fully yourself right now is to give the infinite creator glory. It's to serve the infinite creator because it's through our lives the infinite creator learns about itself. You know, God is experiencing God's self as Rick and as Doug. Um, and I think as we mature spiritually and psychologically, what we learn is the liminal space that is in between the old room of what the status quo was and the new room that has not yet emerged in our life, this space in between, which is always uncomfortable, it's the, it, that's the place of the dark night of the soul, that's the place of growth, um, that actually can become, when you leave the old room, of whatever way you were acting or I was acting or my way of thinking and when we travel through whatever liminal space that was and we get to a new room a new way of understanding life a new way of understanding myself a new way to live then that becomes the old room in the future and we'll eventually transcend that and go through liminal space and then get into another new room and that liminal space is we end up realizing that that is actually home base, that the place of constant becoming as as joyful and as awesome and even ecstatic as that can be, simultaneously you experience anxiety and uh, confusion and fear, and they don't cancel each other out, that they're held together in a graceful way to say that this full way to hold these paradoxes is a uh, liminal space and it has its own glory. And I think if we can hold those things together um, graciously, then that actually can lead us into um, a balanced, uh, humble place uh, uh, emotionally and spiritually that is really, really advanced and mature. And the last thing I just want to say on that, and this is an invitation for all of us, is I don't think that uh, we necessarily need to be looking, of course, if you feel called, go for it, <laughs> but need to be doing uh, lots and lots of uh, different techniques or learning how to do the cities, if you will, 
Um, cause that can be a super duper distraction in my opinion. I had been distracted on that before because you start to, to want to have that all the time. And you start to feel like if I'm not experiencing those things, then, um, I become bored with this third density life and some discrepancies can happen. But the way I have, I think a type of service that we can do, uh, that I don't hear a lot of people talking about, and maybe I'm wrong on this, but I think it's a, it's a good vocation is learning how to embody, remember those paradoxes we talked about, um, the pain and suffering that we might be going through right now. You know, almost everybody that's out there right now listening to us is gonna be going through something that they're uh, experiencing discomfort, and maybe it's a lot. And I think that if we can hold that and even offer that as a sacrifice or even offer that as in union with all other people that are going through the same thing right now, that that offering, that offering of love, that that radical statement of solidarity means something metaphysically, that love counts, that solidarity heals. And I think that if we can feel, truly feel our feelings, feel, not run away from them, but go through the pain um, and feel them out, then we are offering some sort of metaphysical enlightening in the collective that will allow somebody else, either in the future or somebody maybe in a different part of the world, some w- uh, enlivening too, that they may not even know why they had some sort of breakthrough, but uh, it was caused by somebody else, somewhere else, some other cell in the larger body processing their own pain and offering it up as as a as a sacrifice as a as a statement of solidarity and that in doing so um can help uh cleanse or let's say grease the wheels metaphysical wheels that connect us all um, and help us to process the catalyst that we're all going through so i think it's a it's a real service to hold liminal space yeah. is sacred. so in other words we become like a little washing machine where we process we could say stuff that's out there in the collective consciousness that's influencing everybody or that's influencing a number of people, and we can dissolve it um, and thereby, you know, lift the burden for for many people or for everyone. I think that is probably right. What you just said, I think that is the greatest service that we can do is is not live a a crazy, extraordinarily life and not look for that but actually in the ordinary to offer our own ability to process our emotions and then process the collective's emotions through our ability to process them well does indeed filter and recycle uh, this energy back into the collective and the whole collective is then enlightened it, it's a beautiful yeah. vocation and um and groups can do it too i mean i participated back in the 70s yeah. in a lot of large groups that were attempting to do just that sort of neutralize the stress or whatever you want to call it in collective consciousness. And that absolutely makes a big difference. Um, I'm also inviting us to see that when we ourselves are in a crux where we cannot solve the paradox inside us that we feel, whatever, and there's lots of paradoxes that we're looking for, that to hold that paradox, not something that we have to solve, but simply hold it with a grace um, and then offer our own perplex state one in solidarity with the rest of people who are going through it, that that in and of itself is a service uh, through solidarity. And I think that that um, can help too. enlighten. So the next section in your notes is on the law of one, but we've already talked about that a lot. So, um, and then we're going to, we possibly wanted to get into spiral dynamics. So what more is there to say about the law of one um, in this, in an introductory sort of sense here for those who are not familiar with it that you want to be sure to cover there's so much there that uh i don't i don't know if i want to just jump into it and open up another can yeah um i think the bottom line for the law of one is to know that um everything is one and we are indeed invited to uh, live out as the infinite creator here in our human bodies and to um live in a way to create 
a reality that is already metaphysically true. You see, in our reality, in the third density, everything feels and looks separate. And that illusion, as we talked about in terms of the veil of forgetting, is purposeful. But it is an illusion. And if we can live in a way that helps make manifest what is already true, that we are one, that's good third density living. And that leads to fourth density. That's also fourth density living. You know, it's at the same time. And for me, um, I think things like social justice, I think things like learning about the inequities of um, privilege that, let's say, me as a white male have and so on and so forth. I think all those things are important that's coming to the consciousness now for us to look at, not just in an individual way, but on a political way, how can we help uh, see how our own way of living has been oppressing our other selves, our other cells in the body. And it is a global awakening that affects all of the different um, areas of our life, including religion and mm. politics. So you're kind of saying here that um, social and economic uh, inequities need to be ironed out, need to be balanced out if we are to really shift into, you know, fourth density as a civilization. Is that kind of what you're saying? Yeah. Absolutely. And, and if we resist balancing them out, seen. then it probably creates some kind of tension or pressure because the we're, like you said, we're already in fourth density or very quickly shifting into it. And those who drag their heels uh, creates a tension. I mean, that, that's that's exactly right. That's how I see it. And so uh, people who are really looking at change from a political policy level and social justice, um, I think that they might be people who have incarnated to do just that, to help loosen the grip of third density ethos of consciousness that has created uh, hierarchies, you know, um, and are loosening that grip. And this goes all the spectrums, um, marginalized groups are now uh, awakening to their own dignity and saying, we're not different than you powerful people. Um, and so now there's I, I, there's an loosening there, there's an awareness there. And uh, as that continues to grow, um, that would be morphing into that fourth density mm -hmm. living. Okay, good. Um, so... Now, if people want to find out more about the Love One, what are some good sources for that? I know Aaron Abke, whom I've interviewed, um, covers it nicely and has a bunch of videos on it, but what are some other sources? Well, I think that the first thing is you should go to the material itself. And that's easily found on um, www.loveone.info. And so you can find I'll link that to it in there. the show notes also. Yeah. And there's, there's books. I mean, they have books, the Law of One books, too, and you can order them. Um, and that's one thing I, I trust. I really love this about the Law and One, the LNL research group, is that they everything they publish, they always offer it for free online. But if you want a copy of it, you know, you can pay for that. Um, so that's, that's, that's a neat service. So that would be, um, I think you should probably dive into that. Um, and I'm going to include myself in this, every teacher that I've ever seen talk about the Law of One brings their own lenses and distortions. And uh, and so some of the people that I see teaching the Law of One are talking about it. You know, I, I, I hear them and I think, oh, my gosh, you know, that's <laughs> skim, you know, that's not getting right. to the depth that could be explored here. So um, at this point, anybody who's interested in different teachers, try them out. And if it feeds you, great. If you want more, ask the universe and it will be given. Okay, good. Um, so, uh, section three of your notes. Well, I don't know. You, you, you've got the notes in front of you too. I just want to make sure we cover all the points you wanted to cover. Is there anything else in, in section two that we haven't covered that you want to hit on? Um, maybe it. No, nah, probably not. But people are interested. They can go and, and just explore my site. Oh, yeah, you have tons of stuff there. Yeah, I just want to make yeah. sure we pack as much as we can into this interview. Um, all right, so then you have a whole section here, and we're going to mention spiral dynamics. I want to save some time for that, um, about tools for living third density well. 
And so let's skim through some of those and, and devote as much time as possible to spiral dynamics. Yeah, sure. Um, well, why don't we just jump into that? Because the other stuff that I have there is just different okay. topics we can, you know. Sure. Move so you sent uh, you sent me some notes, and there was a a graph about uh, a graphic about spiral dynamics, which I'm showing on the screen right now. You can't see it, but it's up here, and it's very complicated. Yeah. Like snakes going back and forth, and arrows and colors <laughs> and, and all that stuff. And <clears throat> and I've interviewed some other people who have talked about this, like Ken Wilber and uh, and all yeah. Terry Patton, I think. Um, but it's a really interesting way of looking at things, and it help, you know, it, it's not necessarily the only way, obviously, but it helps understand a lot of stuff, including politics and the various, you know, fragmentations <sighs> that that society seems to be splintered into these days. So let's talk about that. Let me give a really quick overview, with the caveat of. I am not a spiral dynamics expert. I'm a, an amateur student, but I do um, find its value and wisdom incredible. And I teach it um, to my clients that are interested and they love it too. So spiral dynamics is a model that was um, began to form back in the 60s with a psychologist named Claire Graves. And he started to interview, uh, I think it was like four or 5,000 people <laughs> At, the, at that time now, it's hundreds of thousands of people. Um, and basically what he started to see was that there were, there were different levels of consciousness uh, that people were viewing the whole world, their whole reality, their whole paradigm could be uh, defined within a certain value system, uh, levels, uh, rungs on a ladder, if you will. But the thing is, is that nobody knew that they're in their own paradigm because mostly we're associating with other people in the same level, you know? And what's remarkable is that there's certain characteristics about the different value systems that can be in conflict with each other. And so one of the things is, is that a lot of the wars that have been started throughout history, maybe 90% of the different conflicts that we've had, both um, micro, con micro conflicts as well as macro, can be sort of plotted and understood through a spiral dynamics lens. So uh, basically one of the things you can understand it is there are different levels and it begins with the most basic, which is beige, and the colors weren't chosen to, to go with the ch chakra system. <laughs> it, they were chosen simply randomly, but they do have a warm and cold, sort of warm and cold, uh, thing, but so beige would be the simplistic bandwidth of conscious of basically surviving. Um, so it's seen in babies and maybe people with uh, high degrees of mental illness or um, uh, hunter early early hunter gatherer societies. Uh, first, when humans were kind of coming online there, um, and then that eventually moves into uh, tribes of very small people, but the tribes begin to, to have, um, uh, it's not individual consciousness, but it's kind of a group consciousness at, a, at an early, early level, uh, not too different, let's say, from a pack of animals. Um, and you have uh, shamans that kind of arise in the, in the purple uh, realms, leaders, different roles. And then at some point, though, um, the next level up from that would be the red level, and that is the well, you power. Way the heck up! I That's, mean, there's turquoise, yellow, green, orange, blue, and the. No, no, no. This it's you're looking at from the other side. Going, we're going beige. It's it's the earliest is beige. Oh, I see. Purple. I see. I'm sorry. I was going from the bottom up. Uh, got it. All right. <laughs> So you're so non-dual, Rick, that you're already starting yeah. from one. There we go. And, and also, I'm looking at a fairly small version of it on my screen. So there's beige. Now, okay, we're trickling down. There's purple. Then boom, into red. Got it. Okay, proceed. <laughs> yeah, and red would be the power at all costs. Um, this would be the emergence of oh, um, the ethos of dictators, of warlords, of... Uh, you're going to find this in certain cultures like um, 
uh, spiral dynamics teachers would talk about prison cultures as being red. Um, and it's, it's kind of the mafia gangs, um, where there's a tight group, but it's, it's strict hierarchy and there's going to be a king on top, always male usually. And it's going to be where, uh, kill or be killed. And, you know, the male, the, the, the king will always be deposed because there's somebody below them always wanting to overtake them. Um, but it's violence and all of this stuff. Um, it's, and we are fascinated by this. Like we, nar- you know, the Narcos, the, the show on Netflix, Narcos and all of that would be very red. And uh, we love it for entertainment. But um, the problem is, is that you can't really form civilization from that kind of heavy handedness. Because eventually, uh, people are going to get tired of being killed, <laughs> and, you know. Um, and so that moves into this new level called uh, the blue level. And blue level is home to where most most people, I would say the greatest gravity of people, are finding themselves in the blue ethos. Um, and this is this is where it's real important to understand what I think is going on religiously. Uh, and, and it's been helpful for some of my clients to understand that maybe while their family is understands life from a blue level, um, they might be moving into the orange or green, which are even higher. And so that there's there's a real conflict. But blue you know what I might do is I might be, put this, if you don't mind, I could put this on your Batgap page yeah. when I put it up. And then so people who are listening to this could go to your page. And look at this in some detail and read all the text and everything. I'm just flashing it on the screen now, but it's hard hard to read. Probably. Yeah, and there's a sorry. Oh, okay. yeah, and there's a lot of really good stuff online about. But blue is important because this is where a lot of the um, uh, religions emerged. You know, it came. Uh, it started about five thousand years ago, and this is the civilization, agriculture. Um, you have specialties, and you have. Uh, religions start to really emerge and take hold. Doctrine and dogma is very important. And God is is understood as out there. We are here. God is always male, <laughs> you know, in the blue conform, conformist culture. And it's a very safe place to be. Um, Spiral Dynamics teachers call it the happy blues. Because when you're in blue, man, it's just so comfortable. Because you're right, um, and everybody around you in your little group is they're right. We, they've got they've got the and truth. Yeah, we, God is rooting for your team. That's right, and you know, blues will fight other blues, blue cultures, because my God is right, your God is wrong, and you know, so and it's ab- absolute loyalty to not just the king or the leader, but it's loyalty to the the whole culture. The whole religio culture, you know. Uh, so this is where nationalism is kind of coming from, and all of this stuff. So a lot of religion, uh, especially institutional religion, um, is going to be very blue, and that's not a cut down. That just seems to be how it is. Um, blue has strong understanding of what would be heretical, and heretical would be to. Uh, not um, to not question what the doctrine and dogma is, because this is how it's always been. This is how God gave it to us. So you cannot challenge this. And so uh, oftentimes uh, Blue will use shame and guilt as tools to demand conformity back into the group, you know, or shunning once it doesn't, once you've said, I'm, I'm done here, then they'll shun you. So you, we cut you out of the group. Um, but again, inside the group, it is very comfortable. Um, but what happens when you've got two groups together, two blues, and then this place in between, the, the, front, the frontier, then, that, that can't fight always, so you end up having a new culture that forms in the frontier. You know, frontier cultures can be these more, a little bit more advanced in a sense, because they're a marriage of two different groups, and the frontier groups start to see uh, they start to have a different value system. 
And that value system is, well, all right, you can believe what I, you believe, I believe what I believe. Maybe there's something, maybe there's not, but let's do what works, you know? So, so this is the birth of the mindset of, of efficiency and science and enlightenment, not in terms of like Buddha enlightenment, but enlightenment the age. Right. Scientific enlightenment, yeah. Yeah. Um, progress, uh, you know, capitalism, uh, let, let's, let's create, grease the wheels of stuff and let's, let's make life happy here. You know, blue is, is very, very comfortable about you live your life sacrificially now so that you can go to heaven and be with God then. Orange, which is the next level up, is sort of seeing, let's, let's enjoy life a little bit now. <laughs> let's, let, let's create some things here so that we can, um, you know, make it nice. And, and, but you also have this preference for rationalization and experimentation. So it's very needed. It's a good thing. But it has its very big shadow sides. Um, and every, I should say, every level has its own shadow sides. But, and that's, the shadow sides actually are what fight each other. So each group will only see the shadow of the other group, whether it's the group below you or the group above you. And you, when you see those, the different levels, the ethos of the different levels, you either think if they're above you, oh, you are aloof, you're wrong, you, you don't know, you're a heretic, and so they attack you. Or if you're below, you know, oh, you're a knuckle dragger, <laughs> you know, you, you don't know anything, <sighs> you're ignorant. So they, they always attack the shadow sides of the different levels. But eventually, Orange starts to see that their exploitation of the planet or of other people um, is actually really problematic. And in seeing and that, they, they shift into green, right? Yeah. Green. And green is the level, and I would argue that this is when really the first, the heart chakra starts to really open up in, in more of an activated stable state or stage rather and the green starts to look at ecology as important it's a greater understanding of the social inequities that are out there um, and it's sort of the birth of social justice understanding and and so on and so forth um, so what you have right now as far as i can see in in our political sphere is you have a lot of people who are in blue who hate green because they see the shadow side of green and the shadow side of green though is there is no truth see blue is there's absolute truth and we know it because god has given it to us green which is already gone through orange and back into uh, into green green says you know all of the belief systems can be challenged scientifically um, and maybe there is no such thing as absolute truth. And so from that perspective, you end up having a skeptical mind where you're just skeptical about everything. Um, so it's, it's kind of the liberal who is always against everything. Like, what are you for? <laughs> they can't really tell you what they're for. They're always against everything. Oh, that wouldn't work. You know what I find is work. a lot of times there's scientific types who would consider themselves to be green there's no absolute truth and, and this and that, and yet they become fundamentalists in their scientific understandings and refuse to even consider things that are outside of the box that they're comfortable in. So I don't know what, how you'd color them, but there's a lot of that. There's this sort of materialism and scientific uh, dogmatism that um, in a way seems to retard the progress of science, although I realize that some of that is necessary for stability. Yeah, and, and a lot of people would put that as an orange thing, that the scientists that are dogmatic in that way um, would would just be or really orange, right center, middle, and orange thinking. And it doesn't mean that if you're an orange, you don't believe in God or anything like that. But I'm saying that inability to um, respect or honor anything that's transcendent to what you can physically measure, that's orange thinking. Um and then, but green is starting to sense that there are larger realities and that there's inequities and things like that. So I talked about the happy blues because it's happy to be in blue, but green, um, they're actually called mean greens. 
and the because there's this sense of it, it is a liberation because you are fighting for justice and, and all of that stuff. So there's a liberation, but on the other hand, it, it, it can be marked by um, a lot of against or conflictual energy. What are you against? And let's fight for this and let's fight for that. Um, and so they can be kind of uh, mean in their in in a way they approach the other systems. Uh, elite, if if you will, and they're criticized by everybody, let's say below them, as being just that elite liberals who don't know crap. They're hypocritical and you know all so on and so forth. But here's the thing, and this is the last piece I'm going to talk about on spiral dynamics because super important. There is all of what I've just described is the first tier, the first tier that contains these different levels. There's a second tier that is above that. And the gap in between the first tier and the second tier is so difficult to overcome that only about maybe uh, 5%, 8 to 5% can, can get there. Uh, but that's where we want to get. Is that where you get into yellow, turquoise and whatever? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm just going to describe yellow um, importantly because what happens with green, the, the, the area where they start to transcend into yellow is when they begin to realize I am not necessarily agreeing anymore that there isn't such a thing as uh, truth. Um, everything is not relative. Maybe there is such a thing as uh, a hierarchy of truth. But all truths can be true for that particular bandwidth of consciousness. But maybe they belong inside a nested uh, Russian doll, as we talked about earlier. Um, and also they start to e reevaluate all of their belief systems that have gotten there. And it's very difficult because it requires a lot of dark night of the soul, that liminal space that we talked about. But when somebody merges into yellow they see the world again with new eyes. And this time, this is the really neat thing about yellow, and this is where we, I think we need to get everybody, um, if we can, and, and shows like yourself actually doing this, is it's helping people to realize that all of the levels below belong. That you can't get to the 100th floor without having the 99 below and a really stable, strong foundation. And yellow can hold paradox. It's really the first level that can hold paradox together. Um, and they don't necessarily ask what is right and wrong in terms of the blue moralism. Uh, they're asking about um, what works for them for, so that everybody can enjoy and realize this freedom. And they start to also um, organize companies, they organize uh, uh, universities, different things, so that there is an integral approach that combines all holistic aspects of things, not just uh, one thing, but it's a holistic aspect. And it is fluid enough to say, well, maybe for person A, um, this needs to be emphasized and this this other aspect this other part of the holistic aspect can be uh help you know to support the main thing it needs to be emphasized but in person b maybe it's the complete reverse there's not going to be one prescription that matches everybody and yellow is really really interested in helping people um, meet them where they're at so they're going to meet somebody who's blue they're going to learn how to let's say put on that archetypal energy, that mindset, inter talk as blues, use the vocabulary, blend in, because it's not one to, blue is not one to be, let's say, uh, shamed and saying you're horrible, but rather validated for the truth that it is. But then if you're a leader, you guide people to start asking uh, open-ended questions of other things that they haven't considered for their own movement forward. And that can help them move into orange or move into to green. So you end up being able to uh, uh, blend in with any of the types, match the energy, not to dominate, 
but to serve their highest good, whatever. Yeah, there's a saying into. in India that when the mangoes are ripe, the branches bend down so that people can easily pick the fruit. And so, you know, it means that a good teacher uh, is able to meet the student at whatever level he's at and provide what's what's valuable for him at that level. <clears throat> and how I use this in counseling, for example, is if I'm teaching somebody spiral dynamics, then uh, maybe they're a green thinker. You know, they're really into social justice and all this stuff that I love too, but they're always really, really angry and they hate their family and they, they hate all of things that's not in their little paradigm of what reality is. And so they're miserable because they're feeling anxiety, they're feeling depression, they feel isolated, all of these things. So we will explore what yellow looks like, try it on for a couple of weeks. What does yellow feel to you? Get, get to know that bandwidth. And then I will ask them, okay, so what you've just said is a very green statement. You know, maybe they said a very green statement. Now I'm gonna ask you, what would your yellow self say to your parents? Or if you're in that dinner place with your parents and our family and there was this conversation, how would your yellow self respond? How would you feel if, if you were able to hold paradox there? Could you affirm them in something and then challenge them compassionately in this? How, how easy is it to and teach people like are, that and to help them shift their color, so to speak? Um, you know, you'd think that, okay, well, really the way one thinks is, is a function of one's level of consciousness and not the other way around, you know, that just by sort of explaining the way yellow works, you'd not, you, you can't necessarily you know, elevate your level of consciousness to a, to the point where it would be spontaneously yellow without having to think about it. Or, you know, I'm just very yellow of me, but I, or maybe it would work that way. It's like you pull any leg of the table and all the other legs will come along, but then certain legs might be easier to pull than others. Yeah, and this takes a yellow approach as, as a counselor. <laughs> Because you have to be able to, to intuit where the person is at. Um, you wouldn't want to really apply this to somebody who's in blue or orange because they're naturally not ready for that. And you probably okay. can't skip a level. But somebody if, you're probably going to have to go from, you know, blue to orange to green. You can't just go from blue to green, right? Absolutely. You can't. There's no nonstop flight uh, to enlightenment. Um, not that yellow is enlightened, but... You do have to go. So a lot the people that I do this with are already high vibe and green, <laughs> if you will. They've been in green for a while, but they're angry and they don't like it. Um, but what's interesting, and I'll say this, say this too, is when let's say you're at blue or if you're at orange or green or yellow, doesn't matter. It's not that you bypass or you, you, you leave off the other thing, ethos below you, the value systems below you. Now, the truth, uh, when you're in the first tier, we talked about the first tier, the highest level is green. The ethos is this, transcend and exclude. Transcend, I transcend the, the level I was and I exclude all the levels below me or all the levels above because they don't exist. But the yellow becomes the first level that says there are levels. And their ethos of the second tier is include and transcend that you're including it all. And because you can include it all, you're transcending to the next level. You're holding it all together, you see. And obviously, I mean, just to shift it to God for a second, that's obviously what God would have to do is incorporate all the levels and sort of harmonize them within that his totality. You know, you can't, can't be cubby holding yeah. or pigeon holding off into one particular perspective because then that there wouldn't be that omniscience and omnipresence and you know universality now this is um what i'm about to say i've not seen anywhere else because i think maybe other people just think that it's crazy but i'm just going to say it <laughs> so i think if i'm going to synthesize the law of one with spiral dynamics here a little bit um i'm going to say that a, a fourth density uh a fourth density place that's a planet is not really going to begin with beige where we talked about the very first um, people are actually going to be incarnating and born into uh, almost the yellow 
Like it's going to be real quick where they get into yellow and then and progress up. And there could be, um, I imagine, fifth and, density and sixth density planets or places where you wouldn't, where even yellow would be too primitive to be there. Oh, of course. I mean, absolutely. I, I think, in fact, I would argue that the law of one is the the the, be the beings that uh, transmitted the law of one are so advanced that I mean they're way above any level that we've even identified. Um, but I would say that for me, green level is going to be the beginning of an of a steady activation of the heart chakra where you can start to handle the love and light required for fourth density living but there's still a lot of shadow work there's shadow work all the way through of course but yellow is where you're going to be able to start um having that universal love and understanding that doesn't exclude but rather includes and that sees that everything belongs in its own way you see and that that is real hard to understand unless you're at uh, yellow kind of cognition, but also living it out in your daily life. And then we have turquoise and coral, it looks like, and then the arrow keeps going. Yeah, well, turquoise would be the next level up from yellow and turquoise is truly cosmic and global. Um, it is it, it, it is the lingo of a lot of new age uh, people or mystical levels of religion. I'm not saying New Age people are, are v actually at turquoise states, but the, the language of being one um, would be very turquoise. Uh, but at that level, there is a way in which you can hold your individual um, ego, not as something to blast through or kill or eradicate, but actually use it as a teacher and tool and it doesn't master you. Uh, you become, it's a way to, uh, to do good things in the world, you know? Um, and then you're able to connect with other people. You can put on energies however you want to, uh, from, to meet people where they're at. So it takes that yellow ability and then amps it up. Um, and so there's not a lot of examples out there of what turquoise living would be. But I think um, when you have some groups that are able to connect, maybe some of the stuff that you saw uh, in the 70s that are meditation groups that are praying in this kind of way, not for uh, changing people's consciousness, because that would be an infringement of free will, but being those washing machines to wash things through and then offering love and light to the planet and then people get to choose to use that or not that would be a very turquoise kind of thing to think yeah and then finally what is coral there um coral has not been explored very much and the teachers that i've seen online on youtube that teach it i i would say that they're not tapping into coral in my opinion but the way i would understand coral is it would be somebody who um can not only sense that everything is one and intrinsically know, intrinsically know that they are God here incarnated as who they are, um, but they are able to, um, maybe I can't even explain it very well. I think that the, for me, the esoteric and the exoteric are one thing at that level. Uh, that there is nothing that is not seen in the esoteric, the most hidden teaching <laughs> that isn't fully realized and explored and explained in the exoteric, the outer teachings of something, that they're all saying the same thing. So there, it's an open book kind of living, and they're able to use consciousness um, in pretty amazing ways that would... Uh, be a, a form of service um, and they would be doing consciousness work but as you can see i can't even describe it very <laughs> yeah, i'm well getting the sense of what you're saying um so oh, yeah. if a person wants to learn more about spiral dynamics what would be a good source for that um well i would say that you can go and look up spiral dynamics just type it online you're going to get a lot um on youtube there are different teachers that teach spiral dynamics that have videos 
the one that I like, and I don't think he's, you know, I, th I think he's a really good teacher. Um, there's some things that I think he's not as deep on, but I send it to my clients and that would be a guy named Leo. Uh, I think his last name is Guru. Oh yeah. You sent me one of those things that I watched it. He did a good explanation. He did a really good explanation. And that video that I sent to you is the one that I send to my clients to kind of get them to, to know. So it's actualized. Yeah, I think I it believe. is. Okay, good. Yeah. So I really honor yeah. and respect his work. All righty. Well, so we've covered quite a bit. Um, yeah. And, you know, can't cover everything, but it's a, it's a, a smorgasbord. That, you know, we can't eat everything on the table, but we have had some samplings of all kinds of interesting stuff over the last couple of hours. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I would say if people want to go deeper into this stuff, um, you know, they can certainly check out my blog and they can check out, um, I would go to the source of Law of One. But I would also say this. Um, this might be the last thing I really want to say. And whatever belief system a person has um, inside your belief system is going to contain at the very depth of it, the mystical depth of it is going to contain a really, really beautiful explanation of the law of one in through its own lens. And uh, so there's not really a you, the one doesn't need to jump into esoteric things at all. Um, one can be very fine in the conventional religion, but to move to the level where you start to really see and live as we are all one in union with each other and in union with God. And that is ontologically true before any belief system um, tells you otherwise. Well, that's a good summation. All right. So um, you said you wanted to do some kind of a little prayer or ceremonial thing as we close. Yeah, yeah, and I, thank you, Rick, for the invitation to come on and to yeah, talk. Yeah, it's really, really been a lot of fun. It. Cool. So I'm going to blow out the candle here that's been going on this whole time. And I would just want to close by saying um, in deep gratitude, thank you to uh, the infinite creator who is giving us the ability to connect today. And we are the infinite creator connecting. And we have created something new this conversation that didn't exist before, which is also the infinite creator. And we want to uh, acknowledge the infinite creator and the participants that will hear this today and in the future. We honor your presence as the infinite creator. And I want to invite everybody, if you want, to put your hand over your forehead in union with the creator's transcendence down into the below the navel second chakra and union with the creator's incarnation and then crossing over in union with the Creator's indwelling presence. Amen. Thank you. Very nice. Thank so you. So next time I miss a connection and get stranded in the Dallas airport, I'll, I'll give you a call and you can come pick me up. <laughs> Please. <laughs> that happened actually a few years ago. Um, all right. So thanks so much, Doug. I really enjoyed getting to meet you. You feel like a friend, and uh, I'm sure we'll... We'll be in touch as we go along, you know? <clears throat> Absolutely. Cool. Yeah. I look forward to that. And uh, thanks to those who've been listening or watching. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, next week I'll be interviewing um, Cynthia Bourgeau, who uh, I've interviewed before. And uh, she, I guess we could categorize her as mystical Christianity. And uh, some other good ones that are scheduled. If you look at the upcoming interviews page on BatCap, you'll see what we've got scheduled. Um, and always, I, I usually remind people to just go to the site at some point if you haven't yet and uh, explore the menu, see if there's anything in there that interests you, like you might want to sign up for the audio podcast or whatever. So thanks for listening or watching, and we will see you for the next one. <laughs>